Hello and welcome to Legendary Africa, the podcast where disembodied voice speaks about African myths, legends, and folklore straight into your ear canal. I want to apologize for poking you in the eyeball last week, that could not have been comfortable. Now, I'm not sure how this happened, but I've somehow managed to slip into your lungs. I'm so sorry. This whole thing is quite the mess. Good news though, your lungs are functioning at 95% capacity. Well done, you healthy human you. I may irritate them though, so don't stress if you have difficulty breathing. It's just me trying to figure out where the heck the exit is. Oh, my. Uh, so. <clears throat> I don't know how to say this, but I think you snorted a moth. Maybe yesterday, the day before. It's kinda cute though. I'm gonna name him Squirt. Hey Squirt, who's so cute as you are. Guys, it is lovely weather right now. There's a bit of a bit of thunder, a bit of rain, it's overcast. Some would call it gloomy, but I call it relaxing. Also, it's really perfect weather for my uh, serpentine stories for today. Some are a little spooky. So before we get into it, I wanted to know how many of you have watched Planet of the Apes? By the way, can you hear the thunder? It's glorious. Anyway, as I said, how many of you have watched Planet of the Apes? Because I feel like it's my duty to warn you that the events of this movie may be becoming reality as we speak. Just the other day, I was witness to the evolving intelligence of a monkey. I was in my backyard, hanging up the clothes as you do, when I spotted a monkey in the tree behind me. It wasn't very large, maybe a teenager, but it was fiercely attempting to open the lid of a large juice box. So I was trying to rip it open with its teeth. From the uh, top. So I thought I would offer some advice and told her that you should rather start ripping from the bottom side since that's where the juice is pulled. Not a few seconds later, the monkey paused and then, carefully balancing the box, ripped open the bottom end of it and happily drank what little juice it found. I was so surprised. I literally burst out laughing. My mom was also there and exclaimed that the monkey had definitely understood me. So then I told it to kindly not drop the box in our yard but to return it to wherever it found it. And guys, the monkey did exactly that. I was shook. Seriously, these monkeys, apes in general, are becoming very clever. They're understanding us. They're imitating us. And soon, they will be us. So today we're heading home to Mzanzi. South Africa is really overflowing with myths, folklore, and so many other amazing stories. I have two legends for you today. First, we're heading to Halleck Falls in KwaZulu-Natal province, my home province, to see if we can spot the legendary Inca Nyamba. Then, we're driving into the Eastern Cape province to Richtersfeld, where hopefully we'll find the mythical Hrutslang. Hold on tight! Now, the legend of the Inca Nyamba is found in Zulu culture, and its existence is believed in up to present day. The Zulu people of South Africa are the largest ethnic group in the country and originate from Nguni communities. Now, Nguni communities are those groups of people who speak the Nguni languages, and examples are um, the Zulu, the Nwaza, Ndebele, and Swazi. Now, the Nguni people took part in the Bantu migrations, which were a series of migrations of the original proto-Bantu-speaking group who spread from West Africa and Central Africa across much of Sub-Saharan Africa. In the process, the proto-Bantu-speaking settlers displaced or absorbed pre-existing hunter-gatherer and pastoralist groups they encountered. After arriving in northern KZN, the Zulu clans were gradually united under Shaka, a powerful leader and warrior, who officially formed the Zulu Kingdom in 1818. Shaka's success lay largely behind the military system called Impi, which he created, his main features being conscription, a standing army, new weaponry, regimentation, and encirclement battle tactics. Now with this power and strategy, Shaka began the Zulu expansion, which played a large part in Mvankane, 
Mfakane, which means crushing, scattering, forced dispersal, and forced migration in Zulu, was a period of terrible warfare and chaos among indigenous ethnic groups in southern Africa, during the period between 1815 and about 1840. King Shaka's expansion spurred on other groups to claim their own territories, which led to the violent clashes between these communities. Now, King Shaka himself had been born into conflict. Born around 1787, he was the illegitimate son of Senzanga Kona, king of the Zulus. Shaka and his mother Nandi were exiled by the king and went to live as refugees with the Matetwa, a group of Nguni chiefdoms coexisting in Kezidin. Shaka became a great warrior there and fought under Dinganzwayo, a leader of Matetwa. When King Senzanga Kona died, Dingizwana helped Shaka become king of the Zulu kingdom, and after he himself died, Shaka took over Mtetwa as well. In 1828, Shaka was assassinated by his half-brothers Dingane and Mshlangana. The reason for his assassination was apparently due to his mental breakdown following his mother's death. In his grief, Shaka ordered the murder of hundreds of fellow Zulus, banned the planting of crops and outlawed the use of mok. He continually dispatched his army on military expeditions until his warriors collapsed with exhaustion. His half-brothers then made the decision to stop their brother's madness. Unfortunately, the violence did not stop. Dengane then murdered Mshlangana, and this was followed by the execution of all his royal kin, as well as the execution of many past supporters of Shaka. Dengane's rule was then interrupted by the arrival of the Boers also known as the Fourth Wreckers, who were a group of Dutch-speaking inhabitants of the British-run Cape Colony, who left the Cape and travelled eastward by wagon train in order to escape the control of the British colonial administration. This was called the Great Trek. In October 1837, the Fourth Trekker leader, Peter Tief, received an audience with Dingane at his royal kraal to negotiate a land deal for the Fourth Trekkers. In November, about 1,000 Ford Trekker wagons began descending the Drakensberg Mountains and moved into what is now KwaZulu Natal. Dingane agreed to give the Ford Trekkers the land between the Together River and Port St. John's on the condition that Retief brought back all the cattle which were stolen by a neighbouring king. Retief agreed, but reportedly only brought back a portion of the cattle. Dingane excused this and signed the agreement before calling for a celebration. During a special performance by his soldiers, Dengane leapt up and ordered his men to capture Retief and his men. They took them all, both Retief, his men and their servants, to a hill where they killed them, leaving Retief for last. Dengane's apparent decision to kill the food threakers has been debated by many. Some say it was due to Retief's thinly veiled threat towards Dengane. Uh, reportedly, Retief told Ngane that the four trekkers had already beaten the powerful Mdwakazi kingdom and exiled their leader, thereby implying that they would be able to do the same to Dingane and his kingdom if he did not accept the land agreement. There were also reports of four trekkers encircling Dingane's land, and so the king made a preemptive strike. Whatever the motives behind his attack, Dingane soon found himself facing the four trekkers in battle on the 16th of December, 1838 the Battle of Blood River, where he was brutally defeated. Now, there is a bunch more to say about the history of the Zulu nation, but it would take the rest of this episode. The sad thing is that I'm not sure how much of this history is completely correct. This is something I've spoken about before and something Rishabi and I would often discuss. History is written by the victors and, in this case, by the Boers and the British. So it's difficult to say how much history has been warped due to bias. So whenever I talk about the history of certain nations, I would like to just say now that I'm sorry if I get some things wrong. My sources are unfortunately going to have some bias in them. But now, let's move on to our first legend, the Inca Nyamba. Howick Falls lies on the Amgeni River and is a popular tourist spot. At 95 meters high, Howick Falls is the same height as its more famous neighbor, Victoria Falls, in Zimbabwe. Howick Falls is called Kwano Ngaza by the Zulu people, meaning place of the tall one. According to the legend, the Inkanyamba, which is potentially a water spirit, 
dwells in the pool below the waterfall, hiding and waiting for its next victim. With the body of a snake and the head of a horse, the Incan Yamba also takes to the sky when searching for a mate, or if it is threatened. If it sees the shining roof of a house, it will dive down, believing that the roof is a pool of water. Once it discovers its mistake, it becomes enraged and will destroy every house it sees. In its anger, the Incan Yamba can create storms, gale force winds, and even hail, wrecking havoc wherever it flies. It is reported that the only people who may approach the pool by how it falls without fearing the Incan Yamba are Sangomas. For those who have not heard of this term before, in Zulu culture, Sangomas are highly respected healers who treat physical, emotional, and mental ailments with various herbal remedies and spiritual rituals. Because of their connection with the earth, the Sangomas may walk without fear near the Incan Yamba's territory. They apparently also sometimes offer their respects and perform rituals to the serpent so as to appease its wrath. Many storms have reportedly been caused by this creature, such as those which ravaged Greytown, Inguavuma, and Pongola. Tennis ball-sized hailstones rained down upon the earth, and more than 2,000 people found themselves homeless after these storms. Inkanyamba is also associated with death in a different way. Some time ago, many Zulu people decided to cross the Amgeni River, but the fast-flowing waters easily washed them away and over the falls. Many people have also used the falls to commit suicide. About 40 suicides have been recorded at this spot. A person named Narina Exelby visited Howick Falls in 1999 and witnessed something extraordinary. This is what she said. But I have my own story. Five years ago, I was at the top of the Hawick Falls when I heard a group of women singing in Zulu. I was told they were asking Inkanyamba to release the body of a relative so that they could hold a funeral. He'd fallen over the falls four days earlier, and there was no trace of his body. Earlier the next morning, the man's body was found lying on a rock on the side of the pool. Was it just a result of the currents, or did Inkanyamba listen to the woman? So did Inkanyamba return the body after hearing the voices of the Zulu woman? Maybe. I think there are many things which cannot be explained in this world. In any case, I would be cautious when next visiting Haug Falls, just in case. The Inkanyamba is a pretty interesting creature, eh? A fun fact about it is that the serpent actually inspired J.R.R. Tolkien, who based his dragon Smaug, or Smog, I'm not really sure. His name, the pronunciation, has been debated. J.R.R. Tolkien based his dragon uh, on the creature after his nanny told him of the legend. I think it's quite amazing how cultures from all over the world come together and can travel together across countries through books. Also, another fun fact is that I have visited Harwick Falls myself. Sadly, or maybe luckily, I did not encounter the Inkanyamba. But I did buy a necklace with a wooden carving of the river spirit, which I often wear. I'll post a picture of it. So my sources for this legend were iol.co.za, gatewaytoafrica.com, atlasobscura.com, and of course, my old friend, Wikipedia. Now, our next legend is about a terrifyingly powerful serpent, reportedly seen in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. The Hrutslang, which means great snake in Afrikaans, is a monstrously large snake of between 40 to 60 feet, or 12 to 18 meters, with the head of an elephant. Other tales claim that along with the serpentine body, it also has the four legs of an elephant, and both large ivory tusks and two rows of razor-sharp teeth. There are many variations in the legends of the Hrutslang. This is my tale. Legend goes that before the world was truly born, the Hrutslang was one of the first creatures the gods ever created. Together, they each poured their strength and might and wisdom into this creature, and created a powerful elephant-headed serpent. But the gods soon realized the terrible mistake they had made. The serpent had no predator, and everything was its prey. The gods sought to stop it, but soon realized that they had made it indestructible. So they made the decision to find every Hrutslang and split it into two, an elephant and a snake. But the gods weren't careful enough. 
and one Hrotslung slithered out of their grasp. It was pregnant, and it hid itself carefully away in a deep cave, far from the prying eyes of the gods, until it could give birth. Using its large trunk, it called out from the cave, luring elephants down to it. It wrapped its massive body around them as soon as they stepped into the darkness of the cave, and crushed the elephants until their bones crumbled, before devouring them greedily. Many, many years later, reports from the Congo claim that the Khrutslang has hidden itself away in the deepest, darkest caves and pits of the Congo, guarding hordes of diamonds and other precious gems. The most recent reports have come from South Africa, which claim that the Khrutslang lives in a large cavern called the Bottomless Pit. Hardly anyone is brave enough, or perhaps they are smart enough not to venture down to look for it. There have only been two instances in which foreign explorers have attempted to search for the serpent and its treasure. The first instance, an explorer tried to use a winch and cable to reach a ledge far below the cave. Landing gingerly on the ledge, he saw many tunnels leading off the ledge, and instantly noticed that there was a strong smell of sulphur in the air. Suddenly, the furious flapping of wings were heard, and out of the tunnel flew hundreds of bats straight into his face, causing him to slip off the edge. He would have fallen to his death had he not been attached to the cable. Instead, he dropped his torch, was hauled back to the surface, and suffice to say, he never tried again. The next instance took place in 1917, when English businessman Peter Grayson went to the Richtersfeld region looking for treasure. During his search, his team was suddenly attacked and injured by lions. When they finally managed to fight the lions off, they noticed that Grayson had vanished. He was never found, and many believed that the Khrutslung had dragged him away into its cave to devour. Some believe that you can escape the tusks and coils of the Khrutslung by bargaining with it, but you would have to be fortunate enough to be carrying very precious gems on you, because it will accept nothing else. And those are the legendary serpents of South Africa. My sources for this legend were very bizarre stories.wordpress.com, all that's interesting.com, mentalfloss.com, and of course, Wikipedia. As usual, I have an absolutely brilliant promo for you. Today we're going to hear about the Mind Bloom podcast, a lovely podcast speaking about mental health and raising awareness for breast cancer. Please, have a listen. I'm not going to take no for an answer. Hello, Mind Bloomers. This is Marina G, your host, and welcome to Mind Bloom, the podcast for all things mental health and breast cancer awareness. I've always known that I'm at high risk for breast cancer. I've always lived with this impending doom in my life. In fact, I don't know how it feels to not have the threat of breast cancer looming over you. And then it just hit me like like a ton of bricks. These people will bravely say that you can choose to feel alive regardless of your cancer diagnosis. They'll say that if you feel you're in the dumps, you can see a therapist. When that thought would creep up in the silence, you know, the thought would creep up, I hate my life. I was so ashamed of it. I was so ashamed. And so I would just push that thought away. These are also the people who describe their anxiety symptoms so minutely that I think they're talking about me and I no longer feel alone in my room. And these are, by the way, the same people who say you should wear your blooming mask and cut the crap already. And I'm so proud to say that these are my people. They're my community. I let them in and I am now, I feel, a part of this tribe that chooses life and love and joy and oneness with the world. And now I'm inviting you in. So come on in. Today's podcast recommendations are Petri Dish, a science comedy podcast. 
profane, insane, and 100% primo science. Petri Dish is a no BS podcast that explores the wildest subjects in modern science with clarity and evil joy. Hosted by Sean Ellen, a nanoparticle immunology researcher, and Nathan Allen, his screenwriter brother, Petri Dish fuses hard science with a freewheeling and madcap conversational style. Cannabioids, plague, cats, the dreaded Kanduru, and the even more dreaded COVID-19. All these and more are dissected with an intellect and irreverence, dropping every week. So reject ignorance. Join the scientific revolution. Join Petri Dish. Now, I was grinning within the first few seconds of listening to this podcast. Hilarious hosts who work really, really well together. I listened to Fungus, the good, the bad, and the zombie. And when Nathan, I think it was Nathan, burst into Under the Sea Plant Edition, I literally burst out laughing. These guys make science fun. I learned a lot, and I think you will too if you listen to this pod. Really fun and enjoyable. Give it a listen. Follow Petri Dish on Instagram at Petri Dish Podcast and Twitter at Dish Podcast. Reverie True Crime Podcast. Paige wants to tell you about all things spine chilling and hair raising. From true crime to weird events, she wants to discuss it all. Now, this podcast was clearly well researched, and Paige sets a very nice pace for each episode. I also like the objective way Paige approaches the crime. There's some really interesting cases in this podcast, and if you're a fan of true crime, this podcast is definitely for you. Follow Reverie True Crime Podcast on Twitter at Reverie Crime Pod and Instagram at Reverie True Crime. The Waffle Shop Podcast. The Waffle Shop is a podcast where myself and a wide range of guests have a good waffle about our mental health, life's challenges, and the minor inconveniences that have been winding us up. Although the focus is mainly about mental health and opening up, the conversation can literally go anywhere. I really, really love this podcast. The host of Mind Bloom Podcast actually recommended it, and I'm so happy that she did. Taylor uses his own perspective to talk about issues like anxiety, self-blame, and coping mechanisms, and I found myself relating quite a bit to what he was talking about. He also has a really soothing voice and keeps each episode casual and personal, which really helps, I think, listeners relate to what he's saying. This is a really good podcast for anyone who struggles with stress, anxiety, or any other mental health issues, and who wants to help themselves get through every day. I know that I'm definitely going to be adding this to my weekly rotation. Follow The Waffle Shop on Twitter at Waffle Shop Pod and Instagram at Waffle Shop Podcast. Please support these podcasts by listening, subscribing, sharing, and following them on social media. And that wraps up today's episode. I have been your host, the Shira, the disembodied voice you cannot escape. The legendary Africa is produced by the infamous Hestia the Dog. And as you know, we have an unpaid intern, Athena the Doggo. Thank you for listening and joining me today. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to subscribe to Legendary Africa wherever you listen. iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever. And share with your friends, family, assorted pets, or any of your local flora and fauna. Plant side podcasts as well, you know. If you like what you hear and want to share that love, please go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes, Podchaser, or anywhere else you can leave comments. We also have a YouTube channel where I publish each episode, although I am terribly bad at keeping it up to date. Also, I've just updated the website, again, so go check that out. And as always, feel free to add the tribute page for Shalia by emailing me your message. All links can be found in the episode description below, and I will have a new blog post up for today's episode with some links to more info on today's stories. I also have a new forum post open on the site discussing my favourite myth, and I would love it if you joined in and told me all about your favourite myth, legend, or lore from whichever region. Check us out on Instagram at LegendaryPod and on Twitter at LegendaryPod1. And send me an email if you like to staylegendarypod at gmail.com. I welcome all myth ideas or prompts, favourite recipes, pictures of your doggos, or any fun or legendary stories about yourself which you would like me to share on the pod. I'll see you next Saturday with an all-new ancient myth, legend, or tale from our beautiful continent of Africa. Until then, tell your loved ones you love them, thank the angel on your shoulder, stay safe, stay sexy, and stay legendary. Bye! (laughs) 